Okay. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm Andrew Brown, and me and Ernesto are going to be talking to you today about automated tagging of image and video collections using facial recognition. Okay, so this is an important and useful task, both for automatically labeling the people in image and video collections, but also for retrieving specific frames of specific faces from video collections for easier and smarter navigation. So first I'm gonna be explaining to you how the facial recognition technology works, and then we're gonna be demonstrating on two data sets. The first one on the left was given to us by the BFI, and then the second on the right was given by the BBC. In both cases, we know the film or TV show that the image has come from, but we don't know who is in the image, so they're untagged. Okay, first, to set the context, facial recognition in an unconstrained setting is a very, very challenging thing. For example, the same person can look very different depending on their age, from when they're a young baby to when they're slightly older. <laughs> um, the same person can have different facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> they can have different haircuts, they can be wearing glasses, no glasses, hats, prosthetics even. The same person looks very different if they're smiling or frowning or laughing. And something very challenging is different viewpoints. The side of someone's head looks very different to the front of someone's head. And maybe if their face is partially obscured by a hat or an object, then that's even harder to recognize. So how do we do this? We first take the image where we want to recognize faces and we detect where the faces are in that image. We then crop the images, so we just have a box around the faces, and we represent each of these faces by a vector called a feature vector. And this is just a long list of numbers. We then match this feature vector to a known gallery of feature vectors with known identities. And then we label the feature vector according to which of these gallery feature vectors was the closest by distance. So this example on the slide here, we would label this feature vector as Charlie Chaplin because it was closest by distance to the feature vector labeled as Charlie Chaplin in the gallery. So this matching part is very easy, but it only works if the feature vector just represents the identity of the person in the image and is unaffected by the things such as age and pose and lighting that we saw on the previous slide. So how do we ensure that the feature vector just represents identity? Well, we do this using a very modern neural network architecture with over 30 million parameters. The input to this neural network is the image of a face like you saw on the previous slide, and then the output is this feature vector that just represents identity. And in our case, we used a 256 dimensional one, so 256 numbers long. The key to how we make sure this feature vector just represents identity is in the training of the neural network. And we train this using a very large database of faces called the VGG Phase 2 dataset. This dataset contains over 9,000 identities and over 300 images of the faces of each person at different ages and poses. And you can see some examples here on the slide. During training, we use all 3 million of these images of faces as inputs to the neural network. We then change all of the 30 million parameters until the output feature vector correctly labels every one of the input faces. The result is a neural network that when you input a face will output a feature vector that just represents the identity, even if the face wasn't of an identity that was in this training data set. So that's how the technology works. So it's, this is to the task given to us by the BFI. The BFI gave us the names of 11,000 people of interest. They also gave us 46,000 images from a selection of films and TV shows. They gave us the metadata, so the name of the film or TV show that each image is from, the year of release, and also the list of the cast in that film or TV show. And the goal was to provide tags for the 11,000 people of interest in these 46,000 images. OK, so how do we do this? There are three main stages. The first stage is for each of the 11,000 people of interest, we download a selection of images from image search engines. And on the slide, you can see it's done here for Brad Pitt. We use these selection of images to compute an average feature vector that just represents his identity. And we do that with as many pictures as we can, because that means the feature vector better represents the identity. The second stage is we take all of the 46,000 images given to us by the BFI. We detect all of the faces in these images and compute the feature vectors for each one. And this only needs to be done once. The third stage, specifically for Brad Pitt, 
we take all of the feature vectors from the BFI images and we match them with the Brad Pitt identity vector. And we, we rank these by distance, and if they're closer than a certain threshold, then we say that face is Brad Pitt. And we do that for all 11,000 people of interest. OK. So a particularly challenging part of this process is downloading the selection of images for each of the 11,000 people. As you can imagine, for someone very famous like Meryl Streep seen here, that's a very easy thing. They have lots of images of them on Google Images. But for some people that are less famous or not famous at all, this is very, you, you can't do this. So we have a way of automatically determining whether someone is famous enough to use Google Images to download <laughs> this selection of images. Um, and by doing this, we, we labeled 6,500 people as famous out of the 11,000. We, um, we have a method for finding the selection of images for the rest of the people of interest, but we don't have time to go into that today. OK, so the result of this is that for each of the 11,000 people of interest, we can return a ranked list of all of the images in the 46,000 images that they were tagged in. And we can return these in a grid with the closest match on the top left. And the closest match means the vectors were the closest, and shown here for Meryl Streep. And we can also return a box around the face that was exactly labeled as Meryl Streep. OK, so I'm now going to show you the BFI browser, which is the website that we built to have the functionality to search for the images in the BFI images that were tagged with each of the 11,000 people. And you can also use the website for, to search for all of the images for a particular film or TV show. OK. This is when there's a seamless transition. OK. OK, so this is the home page of the BFI browser that we built. There are six suggested searches on the front page. And there's a search bar to search for whoever you like out of the 11,000 people. I'm going to click on Denzel Washington, and returned will be all of the images where he was found out of the 46,000 BFI images in this ranked list like we saw for Meryl Streep. So if I click on him, you see all of the images where he was found in the BFI images, along with the name of the film below that the image is from and the date of release. So as we scroll down, you can see many different films where he was found. You can see him wearing different outfits. Uh, there are some black and white films, many different poses, Denzel at different ages. It can be quite tough to see where he was in a particular image. So you can choose an enlarged view, and you can show exactly where Denzel was found in this image. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> OK. So we can also choose to crop all of the images to this face view using this button in the top corner. And here we get a better view of all the faces that were found. So we see Denzel at different poses. We see him wearing glasses, not wearing glasses. We see him with widely different expressions, particularly this one over here. Um, we see him wearing different outfits at different ages. This one is particularly impressive over here because there was only half a face found in the image, but it was still correctly tagged as Denzel. So I'm now going to use the search bar to search for someone else. I'm going to search for Judy Dench. Because we have the pre-computed results, and autocomplete can help you with this search. So if I search for Judy again, all of the images which were tagged of her in the BFI images are returned. If I go to the face cropped view again, here we see Judy at different ages. We see her with very different makeup. We see her wearing hats that partially occlude some of the face. Uh, we see high quality images, low quality images. I particularly like this one down here because she's wearing so much makeup and a big outfit. I couldn't tell it was Judy Dench, but it is. Um, OK. So um, we all know that in metadata, there can be a lot of mistakes. And one good thing about the BFI browser is we can use facial recognition to automatically spot these mistakes in metadata. So I'm going to show you one of them now. So if I search for Steven Spielberg, there he is. So again, the images where he was found are returned. I draw your attention to the first one, which is obviously from the film War Horse, as you can see from the background. However, it's been labeled as coming from the film Anterior and Posterior Plaster Beds, which is a, um, it's a 1930s medical film about how to correctly make plaster casts. Um, this is obviously incorrect, and Steven Spielberg isn't in the cast of this movie. So if you reduce the search to just images from films where Steven was listed in the cast or crew, which I'm doing here, the film disappears, as you would imagine. So this, 
to your system yeah, yeah, yeah. We succeeded, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is an example of where facial recognition has been used to spot this anomaly. So I'm now going to go back to this slide. So we spotted three different kinds of anomalies in the metadata. The first, as you just saw, when images have been labeled with the wrong film. And the example here is how every uh, image from the film War Horse was labeled as this medical film from the 1930s. And again, we found this because we found people had been tagged in an image, but they weren't listed as being in the cast or crew. The second kind we found is when images had been labeled with the correct film, but the person that we'd found tagged had been incorrectly left out of the cast or crew. And there are two examples here. The third example of an anomaly in the metadata we found is when the image had been correctly labeled with the correct film and the cast listing was correct, but we found that someone had made a surprise appearance, such as Marilyn Monroe surprisingly appearing in the background of this film, Ritz, and, uh, and Sharon Stone appearing by surprise in the background of Richard and Judy. Um, we identified over 1,800 anomalies like this in the metadata using facial recognition and we can automatically spot whether it's an error in the metadata or a surprise appearance like this. I'm now going to pass over to uh, Ernesto to talk about the second demonstration on the BBC data set. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, yes, indeed, I'm going to show you another example of face recognition, but this time with video data. And I'm going to use the, our BBC News uh, data set. This is a large video data set that includes more than 10,000 hours of video from which we have extracted more than 5 million keyframes. These are videos from BBC News, from several uh, BBC channels, BBC One, BBC Four, um, at prime time from 2007 to 2012. Um, well, this is, uh, we provide a public web search application that the user can use to perform a visual search over the, uh, this large uh, video data set, um, basically, that over there is the, is the web address. You can uh, take a look if you want. We provide four different search modalities, including people search modality, which, which uses face recognition. Um, I'm going to show, very quickly show you how it works with a video. So let's see if we can, if we can actually use that. Ooh. Uh, no. Here it goes. Yes, so I'm going to be pausing the video from time to time to explain a little bit. Tim. So here we see the main page, and then we, have, we see that we have selected the, the people uh, search modality, and I'm going to search for Bill Gates, OK? So in contrast to what Andrew explained before, there are no pre tag images of Bill Gates in the data set. We are going to do the tagging on the fly. And also, we haven't pre-selected any training images either. We are also going to do that on the fly. So if we press search, here we are using the text build gate to download images from Google Images. Okay? We are taking those images, and we are sending those images down the deep network that Andrew mentioned. We extract the features, and we compare those features with the features that we computed for all the faces that we detected in the data set. Okay? Then here we see the results with a lot of, uh, we can see very clearly that the face of Bill Gates in, in all of them. Um, if we actually move the mouse closer to one of the results, we see, for instance, here, we can use the metadata to, to include the name of the, of the program, where this, is, uh, where this particular result is taken from. We see the word Newsnight repeated multiple times because basically this is different parts of the same video which we detected the face of Bill Gates, or it's just the same program at different dates at times. Also, we see here, for instance, that as I move the mouse on top of the result, what I, I get a more functionality. So in this case, I can use this image as input for the other uh, search modalities. And if I click on one result, then I see here more details about the, the image. I see the image on a largest scale with the detection of the face highlighted. And we can also synchronize the result with the, with the video from which it was taken from. 
and we can play the video. People from Oliver, Oliver Wyman, McKinsey, yeah. I've gone in and spent time on these things. Right. These prices are coming down because we want to save more lives. Right. And, and um, here in the corner, we see, for instance, this was taken from BBC Two on 13th of June 2011. And if we click here, then we go to the web page of the BBC News with more details about the episode. Now I'm going back to the results, and I'm going to try to find one result that includes more than one person. And uh, here it is. If I click on it, then again, I see again the face of Bill Gates here highlighted, the synchronization with the video, and there's more people on the image. And what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to select another face with using the mouse, and I'm going to click search. So here we are taking that particular face on that particular image, and we are doing the same process again. And here we see the results again uh, of, I think this is an ex-president of France, if I recall correctly. And then we see uh, this person, uh, a lot of uh, in the news here. I'm going back to the presentation. Um, well, as you can see, we can do it on the fly, but we can also do the same that we did for the BFI browser. We could basically pre-generate uh, search results for a specific person. Like here, we see, for instance, we see results for a specific uh, news anchor. We can also do that for other famous people or any particular person, politicians, etc. Another thing that we are planning to do is we actually plan to extend the system to include compound queries. These are queries in which we can search for more than one thing. In this example, we are searching both for a face and for a scene. So if I search, for instance, for Barack Obama in the office, instead of, get, instead of getting all these results, I will basically get only the ones that are highlighted in red. We actually have this, this technology already. We just haven't integrated it in the same engine, but we will do that uh, early next year. <laughs> and we can also, we will integrate uh, searching for multiple people, in which the user uh, basically searches for, in this particular case, let's say three actors or actresses. Then we search for the faces of these people in, on, the, on the data set. And then when we rank the results, we first show the results in which these three people appear at the same time. Then after that, the results in which two of them appear at the same time, and then so on. Again, we do have this technology already. We just have to integrate it. Finally, if you want to see more demos or you want to have more information, you, can, you are more than welcome to visit the website of our group where you will find a lot more funny stuff that you can play with. Okay. Thank you, and now we, Andrew and I can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. You were not talking about false positives. Do were there never any false positives? Do you mean in the, in the training data when we're training the facial recognition? Well, not only in the training, but when you look through the films of the BFI database, there yep. were no wrong results. So, so those results were ranked. It was all 46,000 images ranked. And uh, so you get to a point where there are no longer any images of that person. And I quite craftily stopped my search before that arrived. <laughs> but, but they do arrive, yeah. You'll get, as you get to the bottom of all the images where they were, you'll, you'll get maybe a couple of false positives. And then you'll get the very, very challenging ones to get where most of their face was occluded. But you really get most, most of the images where they were in the BFI images, yeah. The false positives are quite small. This is from one of the um, people listening in from um, the, the video stream. Uh, the the 46,000 images from the BFI, here we are at an open source meeting and BFI is a public institute. Will, this 46K, will these 46K tagged images be made available for other people to experiment with? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Stephen will answer that. <laughs> So we're always open to working on collaborative R&D for sure. So if someone wants to approach us and, and they have an R&D agenda and it can benefit the national collection, of course, um, 
which this clearly can do because we can augment the metadata, enable access and drive it and so on. So the short answer is contact me. Um, I can't remember if my email is visible anywhere, but I, I can make it available to the question asker for sure. Similarly, will the um, actual, so the web, I swiped the URL off your slides for the uh, BFI browser, but it's passworded, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, will that uh, ever become public? Because that's incredibly useful for even just like outside. For example, that'd be amazing to tag on Plex, for example. Yeah, we, we made it, I mean, it's protected because we, we don't know the copyright of the images, so. And yeah. um, just to say, uh, the BFI holds the collection on behalf of the nation. We have, we have no copyright in any of those images. The copyright is susceptible to the, you know, the national copyright legislation. So for that reason, it always has to be used within a, unfortunately, within a, a closed loop. Uh, it's hard to see that changing because we'd be in huge copyright violation of publishing it. Um, you know, maybe the scope for for permissions controlled access, but it's very difficult because of the copyright violation, obviously. <clears throat> Under which license is the engine available? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> uh, so actually, uh, most of these engines here are actually uh, open source. We release the first two last year and the people search is re was released this year. So there is an open source version available in GitHub, GitLab. If you go to our web page and you read the documentation, you will find links to the source code. Because we are using uh, the, B the BGG phase two dataset is public. You can also download it. And the models that we are using for training, the, uh, the models that we are using for the face detection, this is also public. You can download all that stuff from the internet. Hello, uh, Jack. Um, I was also interested in this kind of idea of false positives, and then you uh, totally quashed any idea of that. So I was like, ah, oh, damn. But um, you know, around those kind of fringes of the detection and stuff, like I guess is that is that just manual? Do you have to go through those like those lower? percentage matches or something like that and and do you do you is there some way that you correct those or deal with the errors do, is there some way you can feed that back into this kind of neural network or something you know um and i guess in the rare cases that you do get errors maybe higher up h how do you you know higher up in the sort of rankings or something do, does that ever happen and therefore how do you deal with them so if we're if we're providing absolute tags uh, then we choose a very high confidence on the match before we give that absolute tag. So there's next to none false positives. And obviously that will mean that there are some false negatives as well. But when we're providing absolute tags, we prioritize there being no false positives. Um, yeah, when... Is that, is that just manual, that process? Or? No, no, we, we sort of... You, you, can, you can find a threshold that will, computationally, that will mean there are hardly any false positives. And it will mean it's quite uh, abrupt. <laughs> And there'll be quite a few false negatives, but yeah. But, um, but in terms of when we're ranking all 46,000 images, uh, it's, it can't be done manually. And, and that's why we're doing work like this, because you can't go through all 46,000 of these images here, if that answers the question. Uh, hello, it's David Walsh here. Just, um, I'm interested in the uh, time and effort involved in this. So the BBC doing a uh, project, doing things on the fly is impressive, but for the BFI's thing, I mean, is that pointing the software at the BFI collection for 10 minutes and coming up with those results, or is that two months processing involved there? <laughs> it, was, it was actually my, my entire master's project, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah um, so, um, yes, of course, it takes time, <laughs> but it also depends on the hardware you put behind it, okay? So for instance, for the open source version of the, of the people search engine, what we do is that we start few threads on the background to process the whole data. So of course, if you have a, a small laptop, you can start less thread and it will take le more time. And if you put more hardware behind it with more memory, and uh, a, a better CPU, then it will take less. Also, you can, we also support GPUs, for instance, so to speed up the processing. So if you also 
uh, use a GPU will take less. And also, uh, it, of course, it depends on the amount of data. So for the, for the BBC, well, it's more than 5 million images, more than 15,000 videos, and just extracting the friends takes some time. Uh, and also, if you have, we have four search modalities, so we have to process everything four times because it's four different search modalities. So that doesn't take uh, one week. It takes more like a month or, or more. So it depends on the size of your, of your collection. But I can say that, for instance, for five million images, you can leave it running for, I don't know, let's say four or five days, and then you go back and it's done, okay? So if it's like 100 images or 10,000 images, it will be done in, I don't know, in maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So it depends on the size of your collection, the size of your images, depends on many things. Uh, for the creation of your uh, feature vector, uh, instead of using single images uh, coming from Google, using for, for actors using a single film and processing, uh, creating the vector from a single film, wouldn't that be in a way easier? Um, so one of the problems when you're searching for someone through many different films is this idea of domain shift where an actor will look quite different when you go from film to film. Maybe in one actor he's playing a period character and then one actor he's playing, one film he's playing a futuristic character. So if you take all of the training images from one film, you tend to get a very, uh, an identity feature vector that's very focused on that domain that he was looking like in that film. So actually when you take it from Google, even though there's still a domain change, it tends to cover a lot of different films. Yeah, but sourcing from films was...